Okay. Um, hello, I'm Jessica Baker. I'm a software engineer at Rare, and I'm here to talk to you today about automated testing at scale in our game, Sea of Thieves. So first, a little bit about me. Um, software engineer on the gameplay team at Rare. Um, software engineer if I'm like trying to apply for a mortgage. Um, gameplay programmer if I'm trying to sound cool. Um, and I've been there for two years. Um, so during that time, I've worked on all kinds of different stuff, ranging from AI to a little bit of back-end services. Before that, I actually was doing a mechanical engineering degree. So obviously, I'm interested in physics and maths and simulations. But I'm also really interested in engineering processes and how we can do those across different engineering disciplines. So that's part of the reason why I'm so interested in automated testing. Now, if you haven't heard of Sea of Thieves, it's an online multiplayer pirate adventure game, which we shipped last year on Xbox One and PC. Um, and it's a free-form, socially focused game where you're sailing around with your friends in a crew on your pirate ship, doing piratey things, looking for treasure, you're fighting enemy skeletons, getting in ship battles. And we've been releasing it as a game under the games as a service um, structure. So we've been releasing these regular updates, um, culminating this year, or like not culminating, but the latest one is going to be our anniversary edition launch um, at the end of April, I believe. Um, you would have seen the trailer for that if you went to my colleague John's talk earlier. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the journey we went through in developing Sea of Thieves and why we found that automated testing was a really good way of facilitating this games as a service model. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of Unreal Engine's automation system, what it gives you straight out of the box, although I won't be you know, covering everything you could possibly use, mostly what we've been using, which is actually we're developing with 4.10 rather than the most up-to-date versions, so there may be more that I hope won't be able to cover here. I'm going to talk a bit about how we extended Unreal Engine 4 for our needs about how we use our tests and how we get a, a change from a developer all the way out to general release um, as bug-free as possible. And lastly, a little bit of the sort of pointy end of automated testing, actually writing effective automated tests that do what you need them to do. So why use automated testing? Why for Sea of Thieves? Mostly, again, to do with the games as a service model. So we need regular content updates to keep players coming back for. Lots of new content, lots of new interactions regularly. Um, we need to have a really quick response to player feedback to keep our um, community happy. And that means flexible releases. So we actually have the capability to ship multiple times in a week. And lastly is to do with how the design of the game works from minute to minute gameplay. It's designed under the tenet of tools, not rules. So instead of giving the player a rule, so things like you can bail out your ship if it's filling up with water, instead we just give you a bucket and then we're like, do what you want. So that might mean scooping up water, might mean scooping up vomit and chucking it at your mates. Um, and that means we have each, each new tool we add adds a um, introduces a whole new host of interactions to test. So we're constantly adding interactions that need to be tested. So just to take it back to the very basics, I like to explain things from first principles because we all have gaps in our knowledge and um, at, any, at any level of complexity. So an automated test is a program or a script that can execute a route through your software and check that it behaves as expected. And we might want to break that down into three parts. Setup, input, and output. So setup is where we set up the environment that we're, the behavior we're observing is going to happen. Input is actually triggering that behavior. And output is seeing what the outcome is and um, testing that that's what we want it to be. So as a really simple example, say you've written a function that just 
adds two integers together returns the result. If you were testing that, you might, um, just for the sake of argument, so we have something to set up, let's say it takes those integers by reference for some reason. So we are assigning those integers to local variables. Then we can pass them into our adding function. That's our input, the trigger for the behavior. And our output is the actual result of that, which we expect to be 11. And we name our tests according to this structure. We call them given, when, then. So if we were trying to name this test, we might call it given two integers, when um, passed into the adding function, returns the sum of the two integers. So let's talk about what Unreal gives you right out of the box. So Unreal provides the automation framework, which is able to execute automated processes on any kind of Unreal build. And for testing, it provides this F automation test space class, which has a function called run test, which I'm sure I don't have to explain what that does. So on, when it's instantiated, the F automation test space will register itself with the automation framework, which can then be triggered to run it. So if you want to write your own test, you can override this F automation test space class and um, override the um, you can inherit from it and override the run test function. So if this returns true and we don't hit any exceptions, error logs during the course of the test, um, then the test will have passed. And Unreal gives you a couple of helpers to deal with some of the boilerplate involved in that. The first one is inherit simple automation, implement simple automated test. So they've given me a laser. Um, so here's the name of your test class. Um, you're, you can give it a pretty name for it to show up in editor. And the automation test flags can tell you kind of what kinds of builds you're running this against. Um, and there we've just overridden the run test function to test that one is still less than two, because if that's not true anymore, something's horribly wrong. Um, I've noticed there's an error on this slide when it was too late to fix it. Um, this won't compile, obviously. It's not returning any values. Um, so let's just imagine it says return true at the end. Now, the Unreal documentation rec recommends um, a test as an example of how you might want to write a simple automation test. Um, I wouldn't bother trying to read the whole thing, but you'll notice that by the Unreal standards, they recommend that you do one test for a particular class, and you test everything for that class in the single test. Um, that's not our standard, um, which I'll go into a bit more later, um, but that's how they recommend you do it. So you'll have noticed that it, um, the run test function takes a string parameter. And the simple tests don't actually use this. But it also provides implement complex automation test. So in this one, you can over, override um, a get tests function as well. So you can provide an array of strings to run the same test body on. So this, another sort of toy example, um, I've made an array of strings, which are just the names of all the days of the week. And our test body is just checking that they all contain the word day. One thing to note is that they will be considered, each test case will be considered a separate test in the um, session front end. I'll explain in a moment. You're also provided with the means to do latent automation commands. So this is quite similar to how the test helpers work. Um, you, you can create commands which have override an update function. And this um, will keep running every frame. It'll run this update function every frame until it returns true. So if you want to use this, and for example, you might have an object that takes a little while to initialize. You can kick off the initialization and then run this automation command, which might check every frame, is this object initialized yet? And when it is, then it returns true. Latent automation command is finished. So for running automation tests, you have a couple of options. First is the session front end. I think you can attach this to various kinds of Unreal build, um, but it's definitely available in the editor. 
and this will list all the tests that are available in your build. You can filter them, run them, check through the logs, debug, um, and you can find them in the editor under the developers to developer tools section in the Windows um, menu. You can also run tests through the command line. So we use this to um, integrate with our continuous integration software, Team City. So Team City is, ev uh, Team City is able to um, execute various jobs on our build farm automatically. So we use it to build our builds, we use it to distribute, deploy, but we can also use it to run test suites on our builds. So um, we do this regularly, and the most um, regular one is every 20 minutes up to overnight. Um, obviously, the 20 minute ones are, is a much quicker test suite. So we choose the quick tests, but also the ones that are most critical for everyone to keep working. So things like tests that check that the game will boot up and run. Um, and the last one is we've also rolled our own tools for um, unit testing. Our unit test runner tool works very similarly to the session front end and filter, run your test, check the output, debug. Um, but it just um, reduces the overhead of having to spin up a whole editor if we want to use the session front end. So a better use of this complex automation test helper than checking that day spellings are right um, is you can use your get test function to get the asset reference strings of all of the maps within a map test directory. Then you can use your run test function to load up the map, run it, and wait for some sort of test success, test, success, test failure event to come from the level blueprint. And that means that adding a new gameplay test um, to work around the fact that um, Unreal unit tests are so, gran um, so atomic and don't support things like actors. Um, to run, run gameplay tests, you just add in a new map. So then you can use the level blueprint to actually execute the gameplay feature and check the output of that. So this screenshot's um, an example from my colleague Robin Seller's GDC talk on the same topic. He went into a bit more detail, but effectively, um, this test will uh, for force a player input so, so that the player can approach the wheel, grab it, turn it, and then we can check that the wheel has turned. Um, so that's one of the capabilities that we have access to is the ability to fake player input. And we've added our own utilities for networked gameplay testing. So these nodes will pass execution of the blueprint between the client and the server, which are obviously really useful for checking things that happen across the network. We might want to set stuff up on the server and then observe on the client, or we can keep passing back and forth. So these tests can, you know, it, you can very th thoroughly check gameplay scenarios with this. You could do a map test for every single interaction, but there are some challenges with them, one being the speed. So a blueprint map test can take up to 20 seconds, or on average, actually, 20 seconds to run, whereas a coded test is typically 0.1 seconds. Secondly, because you're pulling in, you're sort of testing an environment with every, everything is real, you're using real gameplay objects in real time, um, they can be a little bit unreliable. For example, the skeletons firing cannons feature, which does what it says on the tin, pretty much. But um, if a ship, a player ship, goes into range of a cannon on an island, a skeleton will spawn and start firing cannonballs at it. My bit of the work was um, doing the physics prediction algorithm so that the skeleton knew how to aim the cannon to hit the ship in a satisfyingly realistic way. So um, to test this, I set up a map test in Blueprint with a skeleton, ship, cannon, and wait for it to start firing. Because we want to make sure that it's landing. A cannonball can land near or on the ship. And we can check that if that, that happens by checking the cannonball every frame and seeing if, it, if any of those checks is within range of the ship. And of course, the problem here is that there's no guarantee that our frame rate will be frequent enough that we're actually going to check it while it's in that area. 
Of course, there's other ways to solve this in this particular example, but it illustrates um, how time latency can be a problem for testing, or what you might call one of the four horsemen of the testing apocalypse. Um, I was a bit tight on time for this talk, and I thought about removing this slide, but then I didn't want to. Um, so now you have to deal with it. Um, our four horsemen are latency, randomization, globals, and dependencies. And these are elements that you ideally want to be able to remove or isolate from your test environment. Um, in this case, latency is the one that's causing us problems, because it's not necessarily deterministic. But map tests is still useful. System and boot flow tests, sort of golden path gameplay tests or integration tests, these sort of tests are kind of you want to check that all your elements are working together. So the fact that map tests pull in all these dependencies can be really useful. But if you do want to check every sort of permutation of your um, of your gameplay. What we did is we took it all the way back to F Automation test space. And we added our own helpers that would add intermediate levels of inheritance between Automation test space and your test class to use as test fixtures. So these will provide utilities that can be applied to every test um, so that you don't have to repeat yourself. And one of these can just be setting up a map testing code. So we can create a utility that will create a world, get it ticking, get the right game mode on it. Um, and then to create your test, you can inherit from that. And we have macros that will wrap up all that boilerplate. Um, so as well as this, if we don't need a whole map and we just want to test individual actors, we have an F actor test fixture. And that will create just an empty world with minimum stuff in it. Um, and that you can just use to spawn actors into. Um, now, remember, I was talking about the Unreal example of a unit test being one test per class and all the checks inside it. We find that this can be a bit problematic for um, testing actors because you might end up with persistent state between tests. And also, it's good to just be able to look, have one test be one scenario, so that um, you just have a list of tests passed, tests failed, and you instantly know which scenarios work. Um, and for this, um, if we're wanting to do multiple tests for one actor, we can add actor-specific test fixtures as well, which will just handle the utilities, make sure we're not repeating ourselves. So for example, if we're wanting to test the spyglass, then we can create a utility that will spawn up a, spawn spawn up a spyglass and have an actor wield it, or whatever else we need it to do for it to work properly. We have a few other test types as well. The asset audit is very similar to the map test in that it loads up asset references, but it does it for every asset in the game or in, in our build. And then we can set up an asset audit test for each class of test, for each class of asset. Um, so say you add a voyage type asset, and we want to make sure that if you have minimum amount of gold from the voyage and maximum amount of the gold, of gold for the asset, a designer can't accidentally put in um, 400 minimum, 300 maximum. You can put that in as a check. Screenshot comparison, which the rendering team used. This will automate a scenario, take a screenshot, and compare that against the stock screenshot of the scenario working as expected. And finally, performance tests, which were touched, in, um, touched on in my colleague John's talk earlier, um, where we set up a nightmare gameplay scenario and put output metrics so that we can make sure it's going to run smoothly on all of the platforms we ship to and all the hardware we support. So it breaks down a bit like this on how many tests we have. As you can see, actor tests are by far the most common. We're checking a lot of gameplay through that. Unit tests are, um, do a lot of the similar jobs as the actor tests. Might handle more um, engine stuff because it's basically unit tests where you can't spawn up an actor. Um, map tests, I think in this data, includes both the blueprint and code in map test. Um, I actually nixed this slide um, from Rob's talk that I mentioned earlier. Um, he referred to them as integration tests, um, but they're the same thing. 
um, if that's confusing at all, if you're watching that later. So in total, um, we have 23,000, over 23,000 tests to run. And that's not including the asset audit tests on the basis that, if you remember from earlier with my complex test example, it included every test case as a separate test, even though it's the same test body. The same goes for assets. So we have the same amount of asset audit tests, 81,000, as we do assets. So overall, that's one, over 100,000 tests. So I'm going to go through how we actually use these tests all 100,000 of them. And what's important to note here is that due to our need for flexible, fast releases, we use a continuous delivery process. So this means that, in theory, we can ship at any time. We try and keep our build constantly bug-free, or as bug-free as we can. Um, so that plays out in a bug count graph that looks like this yellow line. The gray line is representing the bug count on Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, one of our previous titles, which was under a more traditional gameplay progress, a process where you reach feature complete and then go through and fix all the bugs. And that's a peak of over 3,000 bugs. Um, of course, this um, bug fixing time can be very unpredictable how long it'll take, and that means it's hard to schedule. That's when you're likely to get crunch. Whereas by keeping our bug count low, we've managed to reduce crunch significantly on the Sea of Thieves project. And it means that we are, in theory, able to ship at any time. So to get a change from a developer to a player, it's going to go through several stages with verification in between each one. So the stages are the local changes on a developer's machine. That gets submitted to source control once it's verified. We take a preview build daily for internal testing. A limited release, so this is players in our insider program who are under NDA, have access to um, early builds of the game. And then all the way out to general release. So the last thing we want, of course, um, is for a bug to reach here. So uh, it's seen by all our players. It's going out on Twitch to hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and we can prevent that by doing different stages of verification at each um, stage of delivery. So in an ideal world, we'd be wanting to get rid of 100% of our bugs before they even get checked into source control through these preventative me measures. We don't live in an ideal world, unfortunately, but we can get rid of a lot of them and maintain this continuous delivery process. So the first one is the session front end, which I mentioned earlier. Each developer sets in their, uh, checks in their changes with a full set of tests for any new um, interactions they've added. And they're, or they're expected to make all the tests pass to you know, the best of their knowledge before they can check it in. Um, so in this case, I might have changed something on the scale from Fort Door. I can see what's, um, what's working and what isn't. Secondly, this is Team City again. You can submit your changes to Team City to be consolidated with the very latest version of the build, and then we can run a test suite on it. So, um, um, so this has to pass 100% of the tests for us to be allowed to check it in. And this is one of my failed ones, where I tried to clean up the Voyage Generator test and cause 180 build problems. Um, which I'm really glad that I caught before I checked it in. Um, I think it was something like a typo and it didn't compile, so all the tests failed. Um, so have to get a green remote run before you can check in. And lastly, it's still a good idea to give your change a quick manual test to catch any test coverage that you've missed or to catch any things that aren't so pragmatic to test with um, with automated testing, visual issues or um, audio issues, particularly. So we've probably eliminated most of our common logic errors during this point. But then, um, once you're submitted to source control, 
This is where our regular automated build verification that I mentioned before comes in. And if any one of these critical jobs fails, light goes red, nobody can check in until it's fixed. Which means that we're enforcing our continuous delivery. Um, uh, we're enforcing continuous delivery. And it also means that if we, uh, as soon as something's broken, we're stopping anyone, anyone from checking in anything else, we can usually pinpoint exactly which change introduced the issue and either back it out or fix it. So we still have manual testers. We have a lot fewer of them. And the great thing about using that alongside automated testing is they're doing a lot less of the sort of routine manual testing or having to check things um, every time there's a new change to it. Instead, they're doing what manual testers are best at, finding weird and funky new ways to break the game. So automated tests are great for the issues you might be able to predict, and manual testers are great for testing things that you couldn't possibly have predicted. Um, and great for picking up, again, those audio or visual issues. Um, so when it goes out to players through the limited release, um, we obviously don't want any bugs to reach any players at all. But if they do, then this lets us pick up some of the lower repro bugs. So if it only happens every one in 1,000 times, then we might not pick it up with our manual testers. But the reporting here is really handy for um, picking up things that are low repro. So um, one of the things that makes people nervous about this kind of process is this sort of front loading of quality into this first um, section. So we're doing all these checks before you're allowed to check things in. Um, and I say, like, doesn't it take a really long time to get a feature done? And the thing is, you're saving time later by d checking the quality now. That comes back in a lot f fewer bugs. And it's so much easier to prevent a bug than it is to um, you know, dig through your three-month-old code later, which has been changed six times since, and try and figure out what's going on from that. And another nice thing about it is, um, one of the things about the manual testing is if they discover an, auto, um, an issue that could be caught by an automated test, we can then add in a regression test to stop it from being broken again. So a nice thing is that even though we're constantly changing the game, adding new things, generally, if things break and we fix them, they stay fixed, which is much more sustainable when we're constantly adding new things. So lastly, I'm going to talk about some best practices for actually writing automated tests and how you can make them effective and descriptive of what's actually where the issues are in your game. And that's another hang up about automated testing. It's more trouble than it's worth. You have to rip up your production code to make it testable. And I definitely felt the same way very early in my automated testing career, so much so that I tweeted this back in 2017. It's all fun and games until you have to write the tests. Um, so now, thanks to some good practices I've learned, and I, I can write good testable code straight up without having to rip it apart, fix it later, figure out how I'm going to test it. With that at the forefront of my mind and using some of these techniques I'm going to go through, I feel much more positive about it now. It makes me think about my use cases, makes me think about my interface. And because, obviously, I do it so well, well and perfectly every time, it's a joy to write the test. So if I could edit the tweet, I'd probably make it say that. So as an example, I'm going to use our alliances feature. And um, this is a feature where, in Sea of Thieves, you sail around in your crew of friends on your ship. And the Alliances feature allows you to form an alliance with another crew. So you can do voyages together or share the rewards. So to keep track of um, all the alliances that might be on a server, we use the Alliance service. So in our terminology, a service is a globally accessible object, and it exists for the whole lifetime of a server. This is good for storing data needed by different systems. So here's some. Example alliances. We've got one between Crew C and Crew D, 
and we've got another one between crews E, F, and G. So let's add some public functions, so an interface to this service. So we definitely want players to be able to form alliances. So if we call that with um, crew A and crew B, that's now added to the storage. And if we want to query this data, um, as an example, let's say we want to get the number of alliances, be an output of three. So when we come to test this, we might be thinking about our one code path, one scenario is one test rule. And we might interpret it that as meaning we want to check each of these functions. So we're starting with the form alliance. You might want to do a test where your setup is to instantiate the alliance service. Your input, the trigger for the behavior, is calling form alliance with crew A and crew B. And then checking that alliance storage to see if there's now an alliance between crew A and crew B. And this is already, we've already hit a problem. How do we check this private data to make sure what the expected behavior is happening? So we might add a getter function. We might even be tempted to make that data public. So instead, we're going to interpret our one code path rule to mean one public input-output flow. So again, we instantiate an alliance service call cool form alliance, crew A and crew B, and we check that get number of alliances now returns one. Now, this is a method called test behavior not implementation. So instead of testing that certain triggers create certain internal states, we can examine actual use case flows to check that they behave as expected. So this prevents, one of the benefits is that the internals are aren't affecting the, whether the test passes or fails. And it's really helpful for refactoring, where you're changing all the implementation, but you want the behavior to remain the same. So do your tests um, still, all, still all pass when you, change your, when you change your code? So let's talk about another one of our horsemen of the test apocalypse, dependencies. So. If another class or a function is dependent on the alliance service, we want to avoid the implementation of the alliance service from affecting their tests. So imagine we're not writing tests for the alliance service this time. Instead, just say, for fun, we have a server friendliness service um, that queries the number of alliances on the server to determine how, how friendly the server is. So an example. Um, if there's more than two alliances, um, we're going to label it a friendly server. Otherwise, it's a curmudgeonly server. And we're going to try and test this. Um, note that we're not testing the alliance service. We're writing tests for the server friendliness service. We don't care what the alliance service is doing. We just want to make sure that this works on the server friendliness service. So for that, we're going to have to make sure there is an alliance service for it to query. And if we're very good, we're testing behavior, not implementation, we're going to call form alliance three times to make sure there's three alliances to get. And then we can call this customer function on the server friendliness service and check that we've got that output. Server friendliness is set to friendly. So what we can do instead is add an interface to the alliance service. And this doesn't necessarily have to be a one-to-one -one interface specifically for the alliance service. It could be, say, you've got a container which is holding items. It might want to refer to the items via a storable interface. Um, so we're adding our public functions to this interface and querying the alliance service through that interface. This means that in a test environment, we can not bother using the real alliance service at all we can use the mock alliance service. And um, in order to make this get number of alliances call return three, which is the input we want for the test, we can set just a random um, int of um, number of alliances to return to three and override from the interface the get number of alliances function to just return that. Uh, or just make it say return three if we're only using it in this test. Um, 
So this means that in our test, now all we need to do is set the number of alliances to three. It is a little bit more boilerplate, but one of the good things about this um, good practice, mocking out dependencies, is that we don't have to know about the internals of other classes. We just need to know about their interface. And it means that any changes or breakages, because before we were relying on these form alliance, get number of alliances function to work for the server friendliness test to work, um, we're no longer a reliant on that because we're not using the real alliance, in, um, alliance service. So the next point is also about isolating functionality, but that's the doing it through the design of the interface. So let's forget about the other functions we had before. Um, and we're writing tests for the crew class, which representing a crew in game. And say this has some functionality, which probably already looks dodgy to you. Um, it wants to check if it should share rewards with another crew. And it wants to do that by querying the alliance interface. So we'll say, OK, so you want to know who your allies with. Here's all the alliances that we're storing. Um, and we're doing it very nicely through the interface, of course. Um, so we're going to cycle through these alliances, find if there's an alliance that contains its own crew ID and the other crew's crew ID to check that. And then even if we're mocking out the alliance service in a test environment, we have to know all about how it actually stores alliances. And if that changes, we then have to update all the crew tests, which is a nuisance. Um, so instead, we're going to care less about what the alliance service actually does and just ask it for the information we need. So you might start by saying, actually, I just want to get the crews that I'm allied with, which on the crew side involves much less alliance-related gubbins. We've moved that all over to the alliance service. And our code looks much more concise now. And then our test, um, all we need to know about is crew IDs, which the crew already knows about. Or we could be even more concise than that. And we could just check, am I allied with this other crew? Which just means that what it means for crews to be allied, the crew does not care about that. All it needs to know is that they are. And that makes the testing all that much easier. So this principle is orthogonality. Treating each class as a black box that only provides the information that you need to know about it, and keeping that logic um, internal as possible. It's generally a good object-oriented programming practice, and it's really maintainable. So if anything about alliances changes, all you need to change is alliance-related classes. So using all these methods and some more, um, this is just a primer, um, it means you get not only get instant feedback on how your code's working, but it also makes you think about thoughtful interface design by making you actually use your interfaces straight away. So in summary of what we've talked about today, Unreal provides basic automation testing support out of the box. It's quite straightforward to extend that, and you can get really good returns, really thorough testing out of that. It makes a great companion for sustainable games as a service through things like making sure that bugs stay fixed. Um, enforces good object-oriented programming practices by making you think about your interfaces. And it takes care of all that routine testing so that the manual testers don't have to. Now, of course, I'm here to tell you that automated testing is great, and I do think that, but I'm not going to make you think that it's going to solve all your problems, not a silver bullet. And that is very illustratable through my favorite Sea of Thieves clip of all time, mostly because of this guy's reaction. So yeah, mistakes do happen, and we're always catching new ways to improve our testing processes to make sure that ships stay where they're supposed to be on the water. So, obligatory hiring slide. Um, if this all sounds good to you, if this sounds like a good way to work, then we are hiring, and you can go to that URL and check out what all our available roles are. 
So thank you for listening. I've left some resources up of some of our recent talks. I think Rob's talk's just gone up on the GDC vault. I think that's available now, about like eight minutes before this talk started. Um, there's some rare tech blog posts. I've got a blog which I forgot to put up on this slide, but if you go to my Twitter, it's linked on there. Um, and thank you for listening. Thank you.